Now, screen is yours. Thank you. Um, so, yes, thank you for the introduction, Maya. And um, I've got the subtitles running. If it gets a bit annoying for anyone, then please let me know and I can take them off. Uh, so, this presentation is about the social ecological factors for physical activity in sport for children with um, autism spectrum disorder. And I'm going to um, talk a little bit about um, some other aspects first before getting to that. So uh, let's, let's go forward. So in this presentation, I will um, um, yeah, I'll cover the ICF. We should all be familiar with the ICF. Um, also cover a little bit about the role of the physiotherapists and what literature, what little literature there is about it. And then write a little bit about the overview of promoting physical activity and some of the examples of the social ecological factors in relation to the efficacy. So we all uh, should be familiar with this model. Um, I really hope so, that I don't need to explain this so much. I think one of the things that maybe that in our field we're so familiar with is looking at the model in this way. And if you look at the work from Kraus de Camargo, he's done a lot of work with, with kids with uh, developmental disorders, that um, we should start looking at this in another way. And this other way is to really think about, do we look at things from top down or bottom up? So when you read a book, you read the book from the top and read it down. So in theory, when you see this model, the ICF, you look at the health condition first, and then you start looking at the body functions, activities, participation, and then the last thing, the environmental factors and the personal factors. But the trouble with that is that the health condition, as we heard from the early presentation, ASD doesn't really change. You know, you can just work with them to change their functioning. So if you look at the health condition, you're not really going to be able to make any change or do anything. So um, it becomes a very tiring piece of work, and there's no means to an end to that. So what was suggested was that uh, we look at it in this other way. We start looking at the personal factors and environmental factors first, and then um, look at the body functions and structures, the activity um, and participation areas. And last of all, is to try to, is to then to say, oh, they have this health condition. So if we can start looking in this way, then we can have a bit more of a, of a positivistic way of seeing some change. We can make some changes to the personal factors in the way that they have motivation to be active in the way that they see themselves and drive themselves to set goals to be physically active. We can change the environmental factors. We can change attitudes of people towards um, uh, uh, people with, with conditions and, and with their access to physical activity. We can change the, the, the political spectrum, the structural environment for that. These things we can change. So why do we not look at the ICF with this first, with that in mind first? Because these then lead to um, changes and improvements in activity participation and reducing the participation restrictions. Of course, the body functions and structures, they can change over time. Like you might develop more mus muscular strength or, or less strength in an area. You don't do as much physical activity. So th that area there is of importance, but I really wouldn't endorse the idea of looking at the health condition first. So let's flip the ICF. And if you, if you know about how to use the ICF, one of the things that has been developing over the time is the use of core sets. Now, in addition to what I had presented earlier about the ICD in 2011, the ICD is also going to be um, merged with the ICF in a way that is better linked between the two. So when you look at the health condition, it's also linked with the activities and participation. And that's part of this family of classification. So it's good to bear that in mind. And with the core sets, it's supposed to be a way that we would be able to look at specific health conditions um, 
based on um, different um, different areas to look at the ICF based on different health conditions. So as I say, you know, we, we don't need to be looking at this anymore. But we can look at a core set that will be able to help with the activity, participation, body functions, and environmental factors. So here was a, a very large study um, that was designed to create the core sets. And as far as I'm aware, they haven't finished their work and they began in 2015 because it is such a big amount of work. But what they did was they did a systematic literature review on, um, and they did a search for uh, different health related outcomes and people with autism. And they did a search from literature from 2001 to 2014. And they found 71 studies that were included in the, um, in the end. They extracted 2,475 meaningful concepts from this. And then they were categorized into 146 ICF categories. So as, as most of you may know that the ICF child and youth versions now merge into the a complete ICF. So at that time, the child and youth version was, was not, was still under discussion of whether it would merge. So but we'll see later on that it's just about the ICF. And there's 99 categories that were most relevant to, to ASD. And they had a criteria of saying that it had to appear in at least 5% of the studies. So that's 5% of the 71 studies that these categories needed to appear. And that would be regarded as being relevant. And so there's 99 categories for that. And that was broken down into 63 in the activities and participation domain, 28 in the body functions, and eight in the environmental factors. So what they, um, what they found was the most frequently identified categories in the research is the, the very first one, the basic interpersonal interactions that appeared in half, over half of those papers. There was the emotional functions, again, also half of the papers. Complex interpersonal interactions. So there's the basic and the complex. These two featured quite highly in there, as well as with attention functions and mental functions of language. So these were the top five identified categories. What I'd like to bring your attention to, if you looked at it if we, from this paper, is the environmental factors. And I mentioned this because that's the first thing we should be looking at if you flip the ICF around. These are things that we can change. Um, and what we see is that very few studies, there's only eight studies in total. Um, even though they reported eight earlier, you can see that there's 11 um, in, in this table. So, much of it is based in the special education setting. So it's very good that we heard from, um, um, uh, uh, in a, from AIA earlier in the presentation from the education section, sector. But also the next most popular level was the health services systems and policies. And that was designed for treating and preventing health problems. And the other studies included areas which would have intervened or looked at families, friends, peers, colleagues, health professionals, and also the individual attitudes of working with individuals. So there weren't that many um, studies in this area. And, and that brings us into a bit of concern because if we can only change, if there, there's only literature that examines these areas to change, then um, it's not gonna get us very far in trying to make the changes necessary. So what these authors did, they looked at, um, uh, another approach to try to find out the evidence and the knowledge in this area was, um, was what it is. And so they, they involved um, a set of experts. They invited about a thousand experts and uh, only 225 of them from all different regions around the world um, in, in WHO uh, responded to um, some questionnaires to try to develop opinions about the ICF and autism spectrum disorder. And what you can see that is the range of people that took part in this survey. Um, about a quarter of them, or just over, over one in five of them were physicians, one in five were occupational therapists, there was about one in six psychologists, and then one in 10 special educator and physiotherapists. And then there's the other therapists that were fewer and fewer 
and some of them were had more than one role, which is why we see that there's 245. There's only really 225 that actually completed this expert panel. And what they did was they also looked at the whole of the ICF and all of the codes and tried to look at which codes were meaningful and relevant for people with ASD. And this is what they summarized to have. But there was 8,792 meaningful concepts, which they could then categorize into 210 second level ICF categories, broken down into 191 personal factors. And these personal factors, because there's not coded in the ICF, they can contain a lot of different things like self-esteem and motivation, et cetera, et cetera. But because they're not coded in the ICF and they, they've not been built in the ICF, they're, they're, they're almost something that we have to look outside in the ICF to try to work on. And here we see 611 non-definable codes that they felt that did not um, uh, work with the ICF in terms of things, for example, the structure, structured environment and behavioral problems for people with ASD. There was also 208 non-covered codes and again, this was slightly overlapping with the personal factors, for example, of stress and social rejection. So again, with social rejection is a is their own personal opinion, um, but it's also related to other people as well. And they also coded 41 health condition codes. So when we're looking at comorbidity, for example, it's uh, it, it can happen with people with ASD. And for example, the codes may be depression, dyspraxia. And epilepsy. They also coded 103 categories that were reported at least 5% of the experts. So that's been relevant and consistent. And that was then categorized down into 37 in activities and participation, 35 in the body functions, 22 in the environmental factors, and nine for the body structure. So now what we see is a lot more in environmental factors. And here is what they reported as um, environmental factors relevant for people with ASD. And so what you see is that we've got 100%, not 100%, we've got 100 individuals. So that's 44% of those experts who have said that the immediate family is important, education is important, rather, and health services. 84 of them said health services was also important. And you can see the rest of the list here as it gets lower and lower and lower um, with regards to those that are considered to be important. And what's interesting is the very last line, individual attitudes of health professionals was only reported by 11 experts, so that's 5% of the experts. When we compare the difference between the literature and we compare the evidence, I mean, the, the opinions of the experts, we can see what evidence there is that's relevant. But we, all can, we can also see where the gaps are in the evidence, in the sense that from the right-hand side, if you don't see a line drawing to the left-hand side, that's regarded as a gap in evidence. If you see a line that's going from the left to the right, then you can see that there is evidence based that it, it confirms the experts' opinions. What we can see is one area of the evidence on the extended family that does not match with the experts, but we see a whole array of different expert opinions that, are un, that have not been researched or did not appear in a review at least. So this is certainly room for, um, for research. It's also certainly confirming to us that we are really um, at, the, at the beginnings of understanding the right ways us to carry out research in this area. For example, um, Craig talked about light, for example. You can see this from the experts, but is there any ev evidence for this? Well, according to the literature review, no, there isn't. So there's a gap in knowledge there. And there was 22 experts that said light was an important factor. So we have to really think about what research we carry out going forward, but also because the notion that if you meet one person, you meet one person. It becomes quite challenging in regards to the way you carry out the research and also produce meaning of what to do 
and being mindful of how you produce evidence-based practice, because not all the evidence is out there. But your practice may consist of what is being considered and being driven from the experts. The next thing I'd like to talk about is from the parents. What we did, and this is with, um, with, with AU as well, and we've not published this yet, so um, bear in mind, please don't take any screenshots because data might need to be treated more carefully, is that we, we got the opinions from 390 parents and uh, we asked them about the perceptions of individual functional difficulties. So functional difficulties is part of the child function module. It's a child specific component of the Washington Group on Disability Statistics. And the Washington Group on Disability Statistics enables the World Bank to find out how many people around the world have disabilities. So when we saw the World Report on Disabilities in 2010, that reported that there was 15% of the world's population with disabilities. That data and that information had to come from somewhere, and the largest source of information was from the World Bank. We also start to see that there's this 15% of the population with disabilities. So if you, we have a standardized way of collecting this, which is being presented by the Washington Group of Disability Statistics, then we can see whether it's actually 15% or 10%, which is what had been previously reported, that it was 10% of the population. So the child function module has 11 items in its short set of what's being regarded as the most important areas of function for children of the ages five to 17 years old. This was built from previous work from UNICEF in their multiple indicator cluster uh, survey. And they combined that with the Washington group short set. And what we did in our analysis was we grouped those 11 items into four different categories. First category was sensory difficulties, and that includes difficulties in seeing or hearing. The next one, motoric, is a combination of walking difficulties or difficulties in um, self-care. That could include changing clothes or um, tying a shoelace or even eating. And the third category was the cognitive difficulties, and that's a combination of learning difficulties, um, so difficulties in learning, difficulties in remembering, and difficulties in concentration. And the behavioral difficulties is a combination of four different items. The first one is um, being able to communicate, and the other one is being able to have friends. Um, uh, another one is to uh, control your own behavior, and the other one is to, um, um, uh, there's another one. It's just escaped my mind, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. What we did was that we used a scale, which was four, on a four point scale of no difficulties, some difficulties, a lot of difficulties and cannot do. And we did use this cutoff, which has been the international recommended cutoff of a lot of difficulties and cannot do, so it's bolded text. And then, what we wanted to find was um, what are the functional difficulties of kids with um, autism? So we had um, 10 to 25 year old um, um, uh, children and uh, the mean age was 14 years old, with a standard deviation of 3.3. What you can see is, is, the, um, is you can see on the the, the top left is the seeing difficulties, uh, which is hardly any. Um, motoric difficulties, which is 7% uh, of them were based on if they had mild, a mild ASD, and 19% had motor difficulties if they were, had moderate to severe um, ASD. And this mild, moderate, and severe was from, um, from what the parents reported. And the parents were asked whether their child had been diagnosed. So these are diagnosed ASD um, children, and they also were aware of the severity levels as well. What we see at the lower levels is the cognitive difficulties. There's quite a big difference between those with mild and those with moderate to severe um, severity of, of um, ASD, in that about 58% of those with mild um, ASD, they did not 
report to have cognitive difficulties, or the parents didn't think that they did. Whereas um, over almost three quarters of the moderate to severe uh, um, kids with ASD also have cognitive difficulties. And unsurprisingly, the behavioral difficulties, almost all of the kids in the, with moderate to severe severity of ASD uh, had behavioral difficulties. And almost nine out of 10 of, mild, of kids with mild ASD severity also had behavioral difficulties. So in this way, what we can see is, is that we can really focus in on some of the functions when we're leading to do some kind of work. So I'd like to bring your attention now to some literature that was brought recently about the role of the physical physiotherapist. And what's been reported according to Campos and, and colleagues is that physiotherapists have a unique skill set to offer children with ASD. And um, I have a slide, but it seems to have disappeared. But, but um, basically, the, the, um, depending on what country you're in, really depends on how much training you may have received as a physiotherapist in relation to working with your ASD. And so in the US, uh, apparently, the physiotherapists have some good training and they are very well prepared to work with people with ASD. But however, this is based in Canada. And what we'll find is that um, there is a lack of training. So they, what Campos and colleagues did was they interviewed some of the physiotherapists um, to ask about um, caring people with ASD. So they, they brought it, brought it down to three different themes. First theme was that physiotherapists can assess and support gross motor skill development. And that can lead to the improvement of physical skills such as walking, running, jumping in free living contexts. They also found that it was uh, the role of the physiotherapist was to provide supportive care in a broader community. That means working with the families and teachers and community service providers and to link with physical activity opportunities like the local sports clubs, rather than work solely one-to-one, -one, like what you might do in, with some other um, type of condition. And also that the role of the physiotherapist is to be part of a multidisciplinary team. This is a key thing that we're not working in silos. They also reported that there, that there was a lack of this, um, expertise, that they lacked confidence and they lacked related training. So nine out of 10 of the interviewed uh, reported insufficient training or education to effectively work with the population. For example, Donna said, I got a referral that was ASD and I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with this child? So there's a, a, you can see immediately what's been said, a, a, a type of fear and concern of what the person is going to do. And because of the little amount of education that was available on behavioral issues or sensory processing, or ASD specific therapies, it became quite difficult to know how to work uh, in a multidisciplinary team. And those that did receive training, they had to complete it on their own interest. So it wasn't part of the mandatory courses that they had. And this might be in your situation, but it's not something you have to do to become qualified. But in some other places, it might be mandatory. So just be mindful that there is training available out there and you may have to find that on your own. And they also reported this third and final theme, that there was institutional, organizational and delivery challenges. So the physical therapist consultation is not routinely provided to children of ASD in, in this context in Canada. And that's mainly because ASD is not a physical diagnosis. Hence, it is seen to be less likely to get funded for treatment. So someone has to pay for this work. And if they, the health system is not available to help to pay for it, or the parents may not realize that this is something that, they, that, that is available to them or is effective to them, then of course, they're not gonna get treated. And physical activity participation is of a lower priority to families and clinicians compared with other goals and therapies. For example, behavior or communication therapies. 
And this means that physical activity is competing with the needs and demands and priorities. This is what the physiotherapist had said. So I, I wonder if you'd like to reflect on whether these are areas that you are experiencing or would experience um, when you are working out in the field or when you are working in the field. But you're also ham having to find these types of challenges as well, because there's certainly not a lack of demand um, for, uh, there's certainly not a lack of sorry, need, should I say, for this to happen. Also, we'd, we'd like to reiterate, there's also not necessarily a lack of people with ASD either. So let's look at some of the evidence we've got. We've looked at some of the evidence in school-based programs that can be beneficial to physical activity. So in a review, it was found that, um, that the school-based programs would most likely have health education components, teacher training components, um, would require changes to the curriculum to have more physical activity and physical education, and also to educate the parents. And it's this type of change that we can do to improve um, uh, the, the issues with regards to physical activity. What has been interesting is some work from Sean Healy that he measured physical activity outcomes and he saw that when they were in segregated settings there was a larger effect sizes uh, in terms of outcomes compared with inclusive settings. So what we see in much of the American literature is this inclusive setting of the school. You don't see, what's been implied here is, is that you don't see that the effect is as large as if they were in their standalone room themselves. And this might be attested by most of the studies we see are quite small in size. But the reality of things is that if they are going to be in society, uh, in physical inclusive physical education, for example, they will be in um, they, they will be immersed with everybody else. So we have to be also careful of the research that we look into or showing how effective something is if we've only got very small, uh, small groups. And this becomes one of the challenges um, that, that we all need to try and find to balance. And I think Craig is doing a really nice job in trying to find that too. So the community-based programs could be through peer mentoring and that that are through peer mentoring are seen to be effective. So that would be buddy programs, for example. So um, that could be one way to get this inclusive uh, mechanism working. If you can find a reliable person that the person with ASD can work with as their buddy, as their peer mentor, um, then they can be motivated to carry on to do the activity. They can be guided to improve to do the activity. And they can also share the same journey with them over the time. There's lots of benefits from peer mentoring. And uh, the interesting thing from Park and their review was that the outcomes did not differ by school, community, or clinical settings. So they did a review and they looked at um, whether, whether um, programs that were taking place in school differed from the community and clinical settings, and there was no evidence to support that, to say that it was better in school or better in community or better in the clinical setting. What that means is that the outcomes are going to be the same regardless for both. Or oh, sorry, not both, all three areas. When we look at the individual, um, one, of the, one of the important personal factors is knowledge. But interestingly, what was found from some early studies is that the individual may not understand the long-term risks associated with physical inactivity. So for example, type two diabetes, cancer, coronary heart disease. We all know about this in our, um, in, in our understanding of promoting health. But for the child, uh, this is not something that they, they know or even potentially need to know. Um, there's also been reports of self, problems with self-regulation with physical activity patterns. So for example, if you set regular training as homework for them to do before you meet with them again, it's unlikely they're going to follow through with that unless if you can intervene with this. And this is something to also bear in mind and technology might, might be the, the tool to help us for this. And as already mentioned, the parents and caregivers 
typically give low priority to physical activity, probably because the evidence is not sufficiently out there. Uh, they prefer intensive treatments like applied behavioral analysis, uh, and that they find has been stressful and time consuming, which means that they're probably not wanting to do anything else. And because it's so time consuming and it's done in a sedentary uh, manner, they're, they're taking away potential time to be physically active. So again, we we are competing as a as a as a field to get what would work best for the individual. I'd like to present another model that's been used to try to combat obesity. Now, what we know about obesity is the energy balance and the energy um, uh, through energy expenditure and energy intake. So the intake is from the food, and the expenditure is from physical activity. And what's different in this model? from the general popular, um, um, population model is the need to connect between the autism specific impairments uh, in relation to physical activity that we see on the top right hand side. So that's the motor, social and behavioral impairments at physical activity levels. However, in this paper, it was done in 2014. What you'll, what you'll see is when you compare that with our data, um, most parents didn't think that there was too many um, children with motor um, uh, impairments, but much more with the social behavior impairments, but they would affect physical activity levels. This then also alters the amount of physical activity levels that they have, which would then lead to lower energy expenditure. And as a result of this, there would be an imbalance and that could contribute towards obesity. There's also the, the, the huge role of the environmental factors as the parents' attitude, habits, and community level services, and also potentially any medication that they take which alters the energy expenditure. So this kind of model is, is a simplified version of what is a very complex model, what we see in the um, obesity um, systems map. And again, there's, there's not too much different from what we just saw here and from what is the overall systems in that this is what the overall system looks like, This is how it can be categorized into individual psychological components, individual activity, the overall activity environment, of course, there's the biology, and then there's the social influences and then the food energy in, in, um, intake areas. So when we look at a social ecological model, we are also looking at potentially areas that are related to social influences and the areas around the individual the environment particularly. So let's look at one particular setting and let's look at teachers because that's what the literature is available for this. A recent study by Oriel looked at some of the uh, perceptions of what teachers thought were barriers to or, or physical education uh, amongst um, kids with ASD. So on the left hand side in, in the figure, you can see that what the number of teachers, so they have just over 100 teachers reporting um, the biggest barriers. And so, so the, the biggest, the most reported barrier was the, the lack of time, the lack of space, and the lack of equipment to provide physical education. And then the second most reported barrier was the motivation and interest of the individual. So they, they, this is a very important part to, to promote, even with people without ASD, is the motivation and interest to be physically active. And then, there's more barriers that were reported. So sensory motoric um, issues, which is kind of interesting based on the data that we had about the parents' perceptions that there was low sensory or motory, motory difficulties. And so this doesn't triangulate as well um, um, with, the, with the previous data. Poor behaviors, social skills, and uh, staff administrative support. Now the social skills and poor behaviors may be lower than what we expect from the other types of barriers, maybe because they, they've been trained to work with poor behaviors and encourage social skills in the right way. As we saw in the early evidence from, from what I have presented um, in, in terms of uh, training up for social skills and recognizing poor behaviors. And the types of exercises that they might give, uh, majority would do fun type of activities related to music and dance. So there's Quite a lot of noise there, um, and quite a lot of um, 
uh, activity taking place. They also mentioned that what are the perceived benefits of physical activity for students with ASD in a classroom? And so this would be uh, something that they that it would is known in the education realm as a benefit from physical activity for academia is what do they get from this? And it's, many of the teachers felt that it improved focus attention, it improved the sensory and self-regulation, improved the mood, uh, it helped them to exert energy, helped them exert gain fitness, and few of them talked about uh, maintaining poor behavior, but there was also uh, about 15 of the teachers that talked about the socialization and the peer interaction. So they saw physical education as an opportunity to do that. Now, this is quite interesting because one would want to expect that um, physical activity and physical education prompts and promotes social interaction. So one would have hoped that this may have been even higher. But this is what the teachers perceived as the benefits. Another thing to take into consideration is how to um, how kids learn. So one of the things that, um, that we saw from um, AIA's presentation technology is, is how kids can really work with technology. And in, in, a, in a setting for, for physical education, there's this type of area of observational learning where it, based on Bandura's theories of learning, there, there's four different realms and a, a few um, areas of focuses. One is attention. A person to learn needs to be attentive to what's being taught. Then they have to remember it. They have to retain this information in the retention phase. And then to demonstrate that they've learned it, they would have to produce it. And they would produce this by frequent attempts. They would need to do this. They would need time to develop this. So they may not get it the first time, but the following week, they may try it again and they've made improvements. The activities need to be age appropriate so it's either not too simple for them for the younger age or too difficult because of their, their age. And also that they need to be able to have the ability to process feedback of what they have done and what they've done correctly and what they need to improve. And then the last part of this observational learning theory is that they need to have the motivation to do it. This will be direct motivation from others, vicarious motivation from, uh, from their friends and peers, and then the self-produced internal motivation behind this. What you see on the screen on the right-hand side is this video modeling. That the child with ASD looks at how to perform the drill and then goes away and does the drill. So they're using technology to support this. And this is where areas of telehealth may be beneficial to do, that, to do this. You show them how to do it through, um, through videos of other people doing it, and then they try to do it themselves. You could also show them doing the activities themselves, and then they can see how they work and how they move and what they need to do next as well. So this could be quite a useful and, and, and a purposeful way of delivering and teaching skills and motoric components as well. Next thing I'd like to talk about is type of activities. So our role in, is to look at the societal sort of impact and societal activities that a person might want to do. And hobbies is now becoming quite a, a key area in Finland. Uh, the Finnish government are now offering 10 million euros to the schools to provide um, hobby activities for, for children. And, and that would also include the special schools as well. What we can see here in this table from the paper from Russell, Healy and, and Braithwaite is the difference in the types, the chosen types of hobbies based on kids with ASD and those that were that they've called as typically developed um, um, kids. And what you can see is that playing video games was a lot more favorable by kids with ASD. So this technology area is very relevant for all of us. If we want to try to engage and intervene and work with kids with, this, uh, with, with um, ASD, that might be the way to do it. Okay. Uh, then, the, um, you know, the next common and popular thing was doing football or playing soccer, uh, whereas 
where they typically developed a quarter of them were interested in playing football or soccer. And then what we see is almost similar types of hobbies between the two, um, other than potentially maybe swimming was more popular with um, typically developed and not with kids with ASD. And there's a lot of reasons for this and some good research about swimming as well. What's interesting is that the contact sports like hurling, camogie, rugby, and other team sports, so you can see this was based in Ireland, uh, were not uh, mentioned by kids with ASD. Um, whether, whether they prefer it or they might turn off from it or not even given the opportunities for it uh, is not known for this. What we also see is about their physical activity levels. So what's interesting is, is that the amount of vigorous physical activity over the last 14 days, that's typically a indicator for, um, for, uh, for hobbies and leisure time activities, is that the amount of, the amount of days is not that um, much different between uh, those who are typically developing and those with ASD. And even whether, um, uh, but there's a slightly lower level of ASD with sedentary hobby preferences. So they are doing, unsurprisingly, doing lower levels of physical activity. What is statistically significant is between the ASD group and the, and the typically developed group is the number of days of active in one week. And you can see that the typically developed um, group were reporting much more days of, of physical activity, um, even if they're doing sedentary hobby um, behaviors. So what we really take into consideration is, is how to convert those in the uh, with, with ASD to doing activities in one week. So let's look at another study by Magnuson and colleagues. They looked at a um, study with six children. And those children comprised of four with autism, one with, um, in, with Asperger's and one with um, ASD, PDD, and NOS. NOS. There was four males and two females, and they had a one-to-one -one ratio of researcher to participants. The activities were done two times a week, and there were one-hour sessions. And there was, uh, it took place over eight to 12 weeks, so they had a total of 16 sessions. What it consisted of was cardio and resistance components, and each program was tailored for each participant. But they had common components of a warm up, high intensity interval training, aerobic exercises, plyometric training, resistance training, and then a cool down. And because they, um, they had it all individualized, they asked their parents what were the most problematic behaviors that they wanted to see a change in. And you can see of the six participants that uh, most of the participants, except for number six, uh, had two um, behavioral problem behaviors. So for example, participant one had a um, the behavior problem of obsessiveness and sleep. And what they asked was to rate from one to 10 of how frequently the, the problem was. And after the intervention, as you can see, it was reduced, and also how it influenced the everyday life, it had also reduced as well. So this will kind of demonstrate that uh, a couple of things here. One, that each person with um, ASD is different from another with regards to their problems. Two, that an intervention that's tailored and using a one-to-one -one ratio works into and um, as an outcome, uh, helped with their problem behaviors and the frequencies of the problem behaviors. What we also see is that sleep difficulties and problems were reported quite commonly by many of the parents. So that has appeared in four of the six kids. In another study where they included 16 boys and there were three girls, what they looked at was the social skills characteristics and their behavior level. And what you can see is, um, is, is the types of social skills that they measured that were compared with below average and average. And they used the standardized cutoffs through, um, through regular means. 
and you can see that behavioral levels were below average uh, for almost all of the different types of behaviors other than self-control. And similar, similarly wise, the behavior level that, um, that, that there was hyperactivity that was above uh, average for, for, for two thirds of these kids. So what they did was they wanted to observe the social skills of, um, from an intervention program. And they, they had a scoring sheet. So this was through a direct observation method. You had researchers looking at, um, at the kids' behavior during the PE lesson and or actually during a physical activity session. Uh, and they got a score for completing these various tasks. For example, greeting, they had to wave their hand or say hi. They had to imitate um, the activity. So as you produce the skill, you ask them to see if they can produce it too. They had to share their enjoyment by giving a high five of at least one peer. They had to have joint attention to attend to something. And this was this exercise was based on stations. So they had to use their thing, index finger to point to the next station as they moved to there. They had to follow direction. So they had to move to the next station following the verbal prompt of let's move or let's go. They were, had to uh, share equipment and uh, they either had to hand over equipment or say uh, it's your turn. Had to demonstrate etiquette um, after they received the equipment that they offered that was offered to them by saying or signing thank you. They had to comment and support by clapping or thumbs up or giving a high five after a peer performed the skill. And they had to assist by picking up the equipment and putting it away. And at the end, they had to say uh, or sign good job or, and high fives during the close. So this was a typical session of what would have happened. Um, I'm going to maybe skip this and just go straight to um, the, you can look at this when we get hold of the slides, but I'll skip this detailed slide uh, to talk about the results and the intervention design. So here what you see is a two by 75 minute session per week. It was an eight week program and the six PE teachers had six hours of training six hours of training to work with this intervention. The, the training included intervention brief, included participation characteristics, so they were told who they were going to be working with. They were also given basic behavior management training. They were, uh, had training on how to prompt strategies, and they also had training on lesson planning. And in the intervention, there was a staff ratio of one to one or two to one. What you see on the right hand side is the, the change in score from the pre and post test, the motor, social skills and the motor skills. As you can see, they are quite, uh, quite big differences um, as a result of this intervention. Before I move forward on this, I'd just like to highlight that the, 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 air, the issue here is, is that we've got a ratio of one to one or two to one, and there are six hours of training specifically for this intervention for eight weeks. So one has to think about the feasibility and the scalability of such a program when you're working yourself. And, um, and whether this is a cost-effective model in the, in the terms of running intervention. And this seems to be one of the challenges that we have, we have research in ASD. So, Let's look at a larger set of scale studies. And this was a very recently published review and, and a meta-analysis uh, from Park and colleagues. This was measuring the effectiveness of interventions involving physical activities for individuals with autism spectrum disorder and meta-analysis. So what they found was 14 papers in the end. And um, I'm just going to go into, the, into some of the characteristics in a bit more detail. Just for an example, because it may be a bit small for you to see. So they covered details about the study from 2011 onwards. They had the gender split, and you can see very low numbers. They had three males in this first study. Second study, two males, two females. The next study, Hawkins et al., one male, one female. 
and uh, another study with seven males, one female. The age of these studies were of primary school kids. Um, and you can see the setting was done over at the school, the university center, so the kids were brought to the university in the, the community or whether they're at the school. The, the, the design of most of the studies were called what's a multiple baseline design. So they got baseline designs, uh, baseline um, data, and, um, and then uh, AT was the alternating treatments design. The dependent variables included things uh, that are not all physical activity related. Um, there could be different things. So for example, you've got this uh, um, a problem behavior in the first study with aggression and property destruction. It, then you might also have the gross motor skills as well. So uh, they really, there was lots of different types of dependent variables in this review. The independent variables were mainly the things that they were measuring as part of the intervention. So for example, the physical activity and decedent, which is exercise, or music prompting and modeling for physical activity. Or they could be equine assisted therapy, so that's therapy on the horse. And then there are um, social um, validity issues where they were, most of them were not reported. And then the intervention dosage. So how, how, what was the frequency? So how many times per week was there? So it ranged from something like 10 times per week to one day per week. Session length of the design like for 20 minutes. So no session was more than uh, 60 minutes. And the duration was not reported for some of the studies. It was like five, six, three point six weeks, and the person who implemented it was also a critical um, person in the in the designs. So that's this would have been, for example, the teacher and the teacher assistant, the research assistant, the ride instructor, the staff, the teacher, and so on. So I'll invite you to have a look at this paper and read this this paper. But what did they find? And what they found was this as a moderator effect for the outcomes. What we see is in this table is the type of physical activity was considered to be quite significant as a moderator effect in terms of whether they were sport related skills, which only a third of the studies had, or exercise. So this would be fitness and um, type of activities. It's also the dependent variables of problem behavior, um, in engagement, compliance, and activity performance. And the setting. This is what we see that there was no significance in terms of the setting of whether it was in a school or community or in a clinic or, cent or center. And the person who implemented it also made a difference too, as well. Whether it was a teacher, a person they're familiar with, or a non teacher, a person who they are not familiar with. And you can see most studies actually had. Um, uh, uh, people who are not the teachers going in there to provide the intervention. Okay, so some concluding remarks. There are large gaps in scientific knowledge compared with the expert recommendations in health for children with ASD. According to parents, almost all children have behavioral difficulties. Most of cognitive difficulties are hardly sensory and motor difficult, rhetoric difficulties. This doesn't correspond well with the other opinions, for example, of teachers. The physiotherapist training is needed as there is a growing number of children who would benefit from physical activity programs. And the setting does not play a role in the effectiveness of interventions. Rather, it is the highly trained individuals that will produce larger effect sizes. Okay, so I think this, this uh, um, concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions or have, uh, comments brought to me. Thank you for your attention.